Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you all had a wonderful, relaxing, fun, safe holiday. Uh, ready to take on this great semester. Um, we are uh, privileged uh, to start off our new uh, academic semester uh, with uh, a person who is truly one of the great journalists of our times. Scott Pelley, uh, who you know as the longtime correspondent for 60 Minutes on CBS News for the past 16 years. Mr. Pelley also served as anchor and managing editor for the CBS Evening News. Uh, what you might not know is that he started his career as a 15-year-old, what we used to call newspaper copy boy, uh, at the Lubbock Avalanche Journal in Texas, and then went on to work as a local reporter in Lubbock and Dallas before joining CBS News. Uh, Mr. Pelly's extraordinary career uh, has been honored with literally every award that we have in journalism, and I'm, I'm going to list off just a few. 37 Emmy Awards, five Edward R. Murrow Awards, three George Foster Peabody Awards, a George Polk Award, and honors from the Society of Professional Journalists, Overseas Press Club of America, the Writers Guild of America, and Investigative Reporters and Editors Inc. Uh, we are delighted that Mr. Polk is actually returning to the Cronkite School. Uh, some of you, uh, but I suspect not many, uh, may have been here in fall 2016 when we had the honor of awarding the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism to Mr. Pelly, and, and I will tell you that if you have not seen it, on our third floor, um, right outside of the stairwell across from our video, uh, you will see a quote uh, from Mr. Pelly from, uh, from that day talking about journalism and talking about you. He has covered the most important stories of our times, and he's done so with his trademark journalism, accurate, objective, comprehensive, and compassionate. Mr. Pelly also, remarkably, in his spare time, uh, has written a new book, which I have right here, Truth Worth Telling, A Reporter's Search for Meaning in the Stories of Our Times. In the book, he writes about the events and people of our times, from U.S. presidents to troops in war zones overseas, to firefighters at the collapsing World Trade Center, and yes, even uh, my favorite, Bruce Springsteen. It is an honor to have him back here at the Cronkite School. Please give him a warm Sun Devil welcome. Scott. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great to be back here at the Cronkite School. Walter was a friend of mine. He was a mentor of mine and he was my hero. And in the closing days of Walter's life, he talked about this place and how proud he was to have this remarkable school named for him. And I can only imagine if Walter was here today on the wonderful itinerary I've had in the school, he'd be all the more impressed with the quality of the students, the passion, the vibrancy of the students, and the great instructors here at the school. Uh, absolutely living up brilliantly to Walter Cronkite's legacy, which is cherished so much at CBS News. One of the reasons I wanted to be with you tonight is to speak to journalism students about our beloved profession. We are hearing quite a bit these days about how journalists are the enemy of the American people. And it's important that we don't fall for that. There is no democracy without journalism. It's impossible. The people who read our work and watch our work need generally reliable, down-the-middle information in order to make decisions about their own lives and the life of the country. It is the life blood of democracy, information, and the journalism that provides it. But we're in a difficult place in your generation just now. 
What is the fastest way to destroy a democracy? Is it war? Terrorism? Another great recession? I don't think so. The fastest way to destroy a democracy is to poison the information. And that is precisely what is happening today as we assemble here at the Cronkite School. Our country is under attack. We are under attack from hostile nation states. We're under attack from charlatans. We're under attack from politicians across the political spectrum who would twist the truth to their own ends. What do we do about this? Journalism. Journalism was invented to be the antidote to the poisoning of our information, to this threat against our democracy. I was here, as Dean Callahan was saying in 2016, much to my surprise, accepting the Cronkite report. And when I met the students here and had an opportunity to talk to you and spend a day with you, I knew that I wanted to write something that would inspire the next generation of journalists, encourage the next generation of journalists. And the last chapter in this book is entitled To a Young Journalist. And it could have said parenthetically to a young journalist at ASU because uh, it was all of you that inspired me to write it. And in my mind, it's the most important chapter of the book. It's an encapsulation of all the advice that I could give to a young person regarding journalism, the life in journalism, writing, and the various things that, the various ethical issues that journalists confront every day. Truth Worth Telling is also an attempt to bring meaning to the stories of our lives. It occurred to me as I was writing the book that I'd had this unbelievable privilege to meet some of the most extraordinary people in the world at the moment that they discovered the meaning of their lives during the great historical events of our time. <clears throat> I, as Dean Callahan said, let me work on the uh, remote control here. I have lots of, ah, here we go. I was going to say I have lots of anecdotes I can tell while we're waiting for this to work. <laughs> you know, as Dean Callahan said, I've been at CBS for 31 years. I've been at 60 Minutes for 21 years, and I just can't tell you about all of the magnificent opportunities I've had to, to meet people, to, to see the world, to go through these war zones. There we go, running perfectly now. And one of the things that you find in this life of journalism is just the crazy characters that you meet. <laughs> from all walks of life. You know, the problem with a lot of these ideas is that the President of the United States is not the CEO of America. That's right. The Constitution is going to tell you no. The Congress we'll is going to tell you no. We'll the see. Supreme Court is going to tell you no. Well, we'll see. And you're not used to working well, in an environment like I that. Do, I do it all the time. I, I Who do tells you no? I do it all the time. Not that many people. No, I do it all the time. <laughs> well, now we've seen as uh, then-candidate Trump was telling me, uh, we, uh, we have seen our Constitution, in my view, working exactly the way it was designed. The Constitution is a circuit breaker that is designed to prevent real damage from either party, anywhere in the political spectrum. It is designed to slow our government down. We call it gridlock, but actually this is something that the founders had in mind, they thought of it as an advantage, that when politics became too crazy, too partisan, on one end of the scale or the other, the entire system would slow down so that it did no real damage. And they gave us term limits for the president as well and the other members of the, uh, of the federal uh, electorate. And so now we're going to have an election, and the American people are going to have an opportunity 
to express their voice again, but they cannot do that without the journalism that we all provide. The most important story, certainly, that I covered in all of my time at CBS was 9-11. This is ground zero on that day. I was there when the buildings came down. I wanted to pay tribute in the first chapter of this book, which is entitled Gallantry, to the members of the fire department of the city of New York, who I watched run into those burning towers against just the chance that they might be able to save someone, that they might be able to clear a path for people to escape. It's the most remarkable act of gallantry I have ever witnessed, the most, act, the most remarkable act of gallantry granted on, to any American city in our history. One of the things that I discovered in doing the research for this chapter was that there was a moment where one of these firefighters was rising through one of the buildings, blazing a trail for the other firefighters behind him. His name is Oreo Palmer, he's an Italian chief. And just above Oreo Palmer, there was a woman trapped in her office on the phone with 911. And this became the narrative that expressed the way I felt about those firemen risking everything in order to reach those people that they had never met. I'll read, with your permission, just a few paragraphs here of that moment between the firefighter, Oreo Palmer, and the woman in the office, who was a young woman by the name of Melissa Doy. At the moment the 911 operator answered her call, Doy can be overheard during the end of the Hail Mary prayer. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. 911 operator, good day. I'm on the 83rd floor. I'm on the 83rd floor, Doy shouted into the phone. The nose of United Flight 175 had hit two floors below her. Part of the right wing ripped into Doy's 83rd floor. Ma'am, how you doing? The operator, speaking to Missy Doy, was a woman, and listening to the recording, I suspect she's middle-aged and experienced. Her voice is earnest and empathetic. Are you going to be able to get somebody up here? Doy asked. I'm struck by the youth in Doy's pleading soprano. Of course, ma'am, we're coming up to you. Well, there's no one here yet, and the floor is completely engulfed. We're on the floor, and we can't breathe, and it is very, very, very hot. The operator was right. There was a firefighter rising toward Doy. Chief Oreo Palmer of Battalion 7 was well known for his unusual first name, which, of course, earned him the moniker Cookie. There was one elevator operating in this tower, only one, and it rose only to the 40th floor. So Palmer took the elevator to 40, and then he started climbing the stairs with all of his equipment. The audio recording of his radio transmissions were lost for years. No one knew what had happened to him until Somebody came across a CD of the audio of his radio transmissions, and I was able to get a hold of a transcript of those. After 37 flights of stairs, Palmer was finally out of breath. The horror of the 78th floor added an edge to his voice. Palmer keyed his mic to request that his next message be passed on to the incident command post. Radio, radio that... 78th floor, numerous 1045 code ones. Fatalities, more than he could count, were strewn across the 78th floor. The four floors above 78 were heavily damaged. 
the nearest survivors to Palmer were likely five floors above on 83, including Missy Doy and five co-workers. I'm going to die, aren't I? Doy said to the operator. No, 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 ma'am. No, ma'am. Say your... I'm going to die. Ma'am, ma'am, say your prayers, the operator counseled. I'm going to die, Doy repeated. In the recording, I do not hear panic. Her voice sounds as though she had come to a realization. I'm going to die was self-empathy reconciling with the inevitable. The two women on the telephone line, strangers who would never meet, formed an intimate bond. We've got to think positive, the operator urged, because we have to help each other get off this floor. Stay calm. Stay calm. Stay calm. You're doing a good job, ma'am. You're doing a good job. It's so hot, Doy said. Then she asked whether her mother could be patched into the call. The operator explained she had no way of making a third party connection. Five floors below, Oreo Palmer began directing the firefighting attack. He radioed the men of Ladder 15 who were still headed up. I'm going to need your firefighters. Adam Stairway to knock down two fires. Get a house line on it. We can get some water on it and knock it down. Palmer had discovered the only stairwell that was intact above the point of impact. If he could extinguish the fire in stairway A, more than 600 people would have a way out. Ladder 15 replied, All right, 10-4, we're coming up the stairs. We're on 77 now in the B stair. We'll be right to you. Before this recording was discovered, Investigators estimated that the firefighters had reached no higher than 50 floors. Battalion 9, I need you on the floor above 79, Palmer advised his fellow chief. We have access stairs going up to 79. All right, I'm on my way up, Oreo, Battalion 9 responded. At 9.57 a.m., it appears that one elevator stopped working. A member of Ladder 15 radioed, trapped in the elevator in the elevator shaft. We're chopping through the wall to get out. Other members of Ladder 15 were stuck in a stairwell. Oreo, one of them called on the radio. We're on 78, but we're in the B stair, trapped in here. We're going to have to put out some fire to get to. Wait! Wait! We hear voices, Melissa Doy reported to the 911 operator. Hello, help, she shouted into the burning room, and then she screamed, help, help. Doy asked the operator, can you find out if there's anybody on the 83rd floor? We think we heard somebody. What Doy heard is unknown. But based on the records that I have studied, it is plausible that Oreo Palmer and perhaps some of the men of Ladder 15 continued climbing the intact stairway A, fighting the fire as they rose. Having received no answer, Doy returned to the call. Can you, can you stay on the line with me, please? I feel like I'm dying. Are they inside with you yet, dear? The operator asked. No, Doy said. Can you find out where they are? Can? That was Missy Doy's last word. By my count, the operator called her name without response more than 60 times over the next 13 minutes. When I got to the World Trade Center, I was on West Street below the towers. First thing I noticed was that antenna on the top of tower number one, the big TV antenna. It seemed to me like it was ticking back and forth like a metronome. And I thought, well, that can't be. And I decided it must have been the heat torturing the light. But as soon as I thought that, it began to come down. You may have heard people describe witnessing catastrophic events as if they happened in slow motion. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that that's exactly what happens, because what I saw in my mind's eye was one floor collapsing and stopping, and then the next, and then the next. But of course, what all of you have seen is the building racing to the ground with heartbreaking speed. I don't know how I got there, but the next thing I remember is I'm on my knees in the middle of West Street, and I'm calling out to God. And I said out loud, God, take them all with no pain. I don't remember getting up. The next thing I remember is I'm running as fast as I can with the sound of steel crashing into the street behind me. I don't know how far I ran, but it occurred to me at a certain point that the conflagration was beginning to subside, so I turned around and went back to what we would all soon begin to call Ground Zero, and I stayed there for two weeks, covering the story for CBS. CBS was on the air for 96 hours initially, no commercials, no breaks of any kind, just broadcasting the news for 96 hours with reliable information in a crisis, the lifeblood of a democracy. When I was writing the chapter entitled Gallantry, I asked myself why did they run into those buildings? 343 members of the FDNY were killed in 90 minutes. It is the largest loss of life of any emergency service in human history in a single event on a single day. Why did they do that? It occurred to me that years before, in many cases decades before, on their very first day in the department, they swore an oath to protect the people of the city of New York, and they had decided then what they would do on this day. It may sound strange to your ear, but I believe I was enormously privileged to be there. If that horrific cataclysm had to happen, it was an honor for me to stand there and witness and bear witness to that tremendous sacrifice. This is journalism in a crisis, in the, in the benefit of journalism in a crisis. I saw a similar act at a place in Iraq. This is the Air Force Theater Hospital in Balad on an air base. This is a collection of 32 tents. It doesn't look like very much, but if you go inside any one of those tents, you'll discover a money's no object hospital in which doctors have all of the latest of anything and plenty of everything that they could possibly need. This is where our most seriously injured Marines and firefight uh, Marines and soldiers, I beg your pardon, were taken. They wanted to shorten the flight time as much as possible from the battlefield to the hospital, so they built the hospital right next to the battlefield. Surgeons wore firearms in the operating room in case the hospital came under attack. While I was there, a young Marine by the name of Kenny Lyon came blasting through the door on a gurney. He had nearly bled to death already. There was a nurse there, Nurse Paulette Shank, who was a nurse anesthetist at a hospital in Pennsylvania, but in Iraq she was Lieutenant Colonel Shank, U.S. Air Force in charge of the operating rooms. This chapter, which is named for her, is subtitled Selflessness. Kenny Lyon came through the door, his last moments slipping away through three lacerated arteries and too many cuts to count. He had been shredded by an enemy mortar while he was turning a wrench on a broken down armored vehicle. It's a battle. You know, sometimes people are fighting to die, Paulette Schenck told me. But in Iraq, she was 
U.S. Air Force Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Etchen, in charge of the operating rooms at the Air Force Hospital on the Iraqi base. Fighting to die? I asked. Meaning their body is going further and further down the wrong direction, and you have to be able to resuscitate them so that we can stop that negative spiral downward, so that we can go back to the spiral of life. Shank stood over Kenny Lyon in her pastel scrubs. A blue hairnet capped her close-cropped hair, which was brown, tending toward red. Her face was free of makeup that might have covered the scattering of freckles that bridged her nose. In her late forties, Shank worked with a quiet confidence that told everyone in the room that she had done this 10,000 times. If Lyon spent another minute in the emergency room, he would reach the end of his spiral. I followed as he was rushed into the next tent, an operating room, where five surgeons went to work, two at Lyon's head, one at his torso, and two at his legs. IVs of blood and fluids would buy time, but if they couldn't stop the bleeding soon, they would lose him. I watched the surgery go on hour after hour. They had to take Penny's left leg because there was just no repairing that artery. Two hours, three hours, four hours into the surgery, a nurse came into the operating room and informed the surgeons that the blood bank was out of blood. The whole supply of fresh blood had run through Lion's heart and out onto the white linoleum floor. I'll get you more, Shank called into the room. She bolted out of the door. More, I said to myself, there isn't any more. I ran after Shank through the plywood corridor that led to the next tent. When I entered the blood bank, she had already opened her own arms. Lying on a gurney, under the glare of bare fluorescent tubes, her blood was draining into plastic bags. She gambled that these pipes might stall the deaf man, while loudspeakers announced the shortage to every available airman. Walt Whitman captured the sense of this. The American poet was a nurse in the Civil War. In The Wound Dresser, he writes of a fallen soldier, One turns to me his appealing eyes. Poor boy, I never knew you. Yet I think I could not refuse this moment to die for you if it would save you. Paulette Shank told me, Our job is to resuscitate, to allow the surgeon's time to stop the bleeding and you try her voice cracked under the weight of memories you try so hard and sometimes you're not successful she paused looked away to a distant time and closed her eyes her voice dropped to a whisper and it hurts you feel like you let the soldier down, you know? The wicked death spiral won and you fought so hard. We fight so hard against him winning, you know? And sometimes the deaf man wins. But not this time. The blood that Paulette Shank sent into the operating room allowed time for at least 80 airmen, soldiers, sailors, and marines to line up outside the blood bank and bags of blood, pint after pint after pint, went into the operating room. The surgery went on another, another hour, another hour, until six hours had passed, and they saved Kenny Lyon's life. I met the conscious Kenny Lyon about three months later at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He was trying to get used to his new prosthetic leg. He, his jaw was wired, he'd lost part of his tongue. And so I sat down with Kenny and I said, Kenny, how's it going? And he said, it's going great. I'm alive. And I said, going great? I mean, what do you mean? 
And this is a direct quote from Lance Corporal Kenny Lyon. He said, it's all gravy from here. <laughs> you know, many people ask me, and in fact, I've been asked many times today, uh, what is my favorite interview at 60 Minutes? Well, I've been at 60 Minutes 21 years, which means I've done about 500 stories, and I love all my children. <laughs> but there is one interview that was particularly engrossing and helped inform the nation during a different time of crisis. It was an interview from a guy who was right here on the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico in 2011 when it exploded and sank, setting off the largest oil spill in history. The interview was a guy with a guy named Mike Williams. He was the electronics engineer. He fixed all the gadgets in a shop in the ship, all the gadgets that kept everything running. And he explained to me the moment that the explosion happened. He was sitting in the shop, it was at night, and suddenly, he heard the engines, the big turbine engines that powered the ship, start to spin out of control. He couldn't understand what, it, what he was hearing. What he didn't realize was that methane gas from five miles below was spreading out over the deck and getting sucked into the turbines, causing them to spin way out of control. This is the way Mike described it in our interview on 60 Minutes. The higher the engine's revving, the lights are, are glowing. I'm hearing the alarms. I mean, they're, they're in a constant state now. It's just beep, 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 beep. It doesn't stop. But even that's starting to get drowned out by the sound of the engine increasing in speed. And my lights get so incredibly bright that they, they physically explode. Um, I'm, I'm pushing my way back from the desk when my computer monitor exploded. And I reached for the door, uh, the door to exit my shop. These are three inch thick steel fire rated doors with six stainless steel hinges supporting them on the frame. As I reached for the handle, I heard this awful hissing noise, this whoosh, and at the height of the hiss, a huge explosion. The explosion uh, literally rips the door from the hinges, it hits, impacts me and takes me to the other side of the shop. And I'm up against the wall when I finally come around with a door on top of me. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this, this is it. I'm going to die right here. As I got to the next door, it exploded. And took me, the door, and slid me about 35 feet backwards again. And planted me up against another wall. At that point, I actually got angry. I was mad at the doors. I was mad that these, these fire doors that are supposed to protect me are hurting me. These fire doors are trying to kill me. And at that point, I, I made a decision. I'm going to get outside. I may die out there, but I'm going to get outside. Every Sunday morning, they practice the lifeboat drills. They practice lifeboat work boat drills every week because they wanted to make sure that in an emergency no one would be left behind. Mike Williams got outside. He got up on the deck and discovered that the lifeboats were all gone. There were several other crew members now stranded on the deck with him. One of them was a woman by the name of Andrea. I remember looking to, at, at Andrea and telling her, or looking at her and, and seeing that, that look in her eyes of she had quit, she had given up. I remember her saying, I'm scared. And I said, it's okay to be scared, I'm scared too. She said, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna burn up or we're gonna jump. And she said she couldn't jump. I remember telling her, if you don't jump, I'm gonna throw you. you we have to get off of here. We can't stay here. How far is it to the sea? Maybe 90 feet, 100 feet. Uh, it's, it's a long ways. I remember closing my eyes and, and saying a prayer. And, uh, <clears throat> and 
asking God to tell my wife, little girl, that uh, Daddy did everything he could. And, and if I survive this, it's for a reason. I made those three steps. I pushed off the injury. And I fell for what seemed like forever. A lot of things go through your mind. Mike and Andrea fell wearing their life jackets. They hit the water only to discover that there was so much oil and gas in the water that the water was on fire. And just at that moment, Mike hears, over here, over here, fishing boats, dozens of fishing boats. No one called them, no one sent them. They saw the explosion and came racing to the aid of their fellow mariners and were able to pluck Mike and Andrea and many others out of the water before they were consumed by the flames at great risk to themselves. Now, when we did this story, the story went on to describe what we had learned in our investigation of how this cataclysm had occurred. And while the story is on the air, and for weeks afterwards, the oil is still pouring out onto the seafloor. Congress was trying to get answers. And the next day, Monday, after our broadcast, the House and the Senate were holding hearings. They were frustrated because they hadn't been able to find out the things that they needed to know about how this could have happened. The witness on Monday was Ken Salazar, who was the Secretary of the Interior, and as Secretary of the Interior, he had authority over offshore drilling. This is what happened in the House and the Senate the next day, hours after our 60 Minutes story aired. Last night I saw the rerun of the, uh, in fact I saw it three times, Mike Williams on 60 Minutes, I'm sure all of you saw that. I did not watch the 60 Minute episode uh, that you referred to. The 60 Minutes did a piece, as is so often the case, that I thought was really interesting. We hear from on 60 Minutes what we couldn't hear from uh, industry witnesses. I, I don't know if you had the chance to see the 60 Minutes, uh, uh, call it expose. I did not watch the 60 Minutes program. I watched 60 Minutes on Sunday. I did not watch it because I had been uh, working on uh, the Gulf incident <laughs> nonstop, so I'm not. I did this not this is the Gulf it. incident we're talking about. <laughs> the moral of that story is don't miss 60 Minutes. <laughs> that we do in journalism, one of the most gratifying things we do in journalism is give voice to the voiceless. I had an opportunity to do that in China in 1998. President Clinton was to be the first president of the United States to visit China since the Tiananmen Square massacre. You all recall what happened at Tiananmen Square. The square had filled with unknown hundreds, thousands of young people who were demonstrating for democracy. They even created a Statue of Liberty, cobbled together and rolled it into the middle of the square. And there were Chinese hardliners who wanted to send the military in to clear the square. This went on for weeks. One of the things standing in the way of the military was a man by the name of Bao Tong. He was chief of staff to the Chinese president. And he would not entertain for a moment the idea of sending in the troops. Well, we all know what happened. The hardliners won. But before they were able to send in the troops, and before the massacre of unknown hundreds, if not thousands of people, there was one thing they had to do first. They had to get rid of Bautong. So they sent in the secret police and arrested him, put him in prison, and left him in solitary confinement for years. 
As I was traveling with the president to Beijing, a few days before that, Bao had been released from prison, and I desperately wanted to interview him. Now, how much do you imagine that someone who's just been released from a decade in solitary confinement wants to go on CBS and criticize his government? It turned out very, very much. But there was a problem. This is why this chapter is entitled Courage. Bao was under 24-7 secret police surveillance. They had guards at his front door. They were never going to let me go visit him there. They were never going to let him come to a hotel or someplace that I'd set up cameras to do an interview. So Bill Owens, who was my producer then, but today is the executive producer of 60 Minutes. You know when they say be kind to people on the way up because you're going to meet them on the way down? That's exactly what happened to me. Bill used to work for me, and now I work for Bill. Bill Owens came up with a plan for interviewing Bao Tong. It was a plan that would unfold in Purple Bamboo Park, a 115-acre oasis of lakes and lawns in northwest Beijing and the fluent part of the capital where the universities are clustered. On June 27, 1998, Bao Tong ambled down one of the pathways in the park and settled onto a green wooden bench. Across the path, directly opposite Bao, our cameraman, Raleigh Malitzi, sat with a camera hidden in a shoulder bag. I came from the opposite direction and sat with Bao, a nearly invisible wireless microphone pinned inside my shirt. There was no telling what would happen next as this soft-spoken man risked everything to test his people's right to know. The park was blossoming that summer. The sky was gauzed by high cirrus. Families in canopy boats drifted through groves of lotus propelled by gondoliers, sculling red oars in a lazy rhythm. Along the edges of the park's concrete trails, bamboo pickets had been set up to keep visitors off the meticulously, carefully tended greens. Bao was 59 when he went to prison for revealing state secrets and counter-revolutionary propagandizing, the same ambiguous charge China uses today to jail journalists. Despite prison, Bao looked younger than his 66 years. He was as slender as the reeds nodding in the lake. Bao told me that his isolation had liberated his mind from Communist Party dogma. He began, according to our Constitution, I have the freedom of speech. If I, I do not know whether I have the freedom of speech, and I think CBS can conduct a test. Let's see if I get into trouble after your interview with me. If so, it will demonstrate that our government does not respect our own constitution. What should Americans understand about the struggle in China, I asked. If people can check and balance the power of the government, then the government can become a force that safeguards world peace. Otherwise, it's a dangerous force. After a few minutes, we parted. Bao ambled away. I walked in the opposite direction, and that's when I noticed another cameraman with a shoulder bag. From the zippered opening protruded an absurdly large lens. He was a member of the Chinese secret police surveillance unit. Bill, our Beijing producer Natalie, and I quickened our pace slightly but deliberately. A moment later, I saw a furious man sprinting toward us. He was red with rage and closing fast. We began an undignified trot, but the man kept accelerating and screaming, now waving a fist. I began wondering about Chinese jails as we broke into a full run. The man matched our pace. Natalie and I were falling short of breath when I shouted, What's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying, keep off the grass. <laughs> you can't make these things up. 
Nothing happened to Bao, but three months after, the secret police knocked in the door of Natalie Liu's apartment and handcuffed her and took her away in front of her children. I, at that point, was with the president in Ireland, and I went to the national security advisor, and I said, look, I know we don't always agree about things, but I need your help on this. I don't know if that's what did the trick, but about a week later, Natalie and her entire family were deported from China to Washington, D.C., where she has had a long career at Voice of America. One more quick anecdote before I take your questions. I had put the book to bed, and an event occurred that led me to pick up the phone and call my editor at HarperCollins and say, literally, stop the presses. Uh, I have another story that has got to be in this book. This is the front line against ISIS in northern Iraq. That's a Peshmerga fighter there. Beyond him is the territory that was being held at that time by ISIS. We had gone there to work on a story about the horrible atrocities and human rights violations that were occurring at the hands of ISIS. And we met this woman. She's a Yazidi. The Yazidis are people who practice a religion that predates Christianity by a thousand years. And when ISIS swept into her village, they considered the Yazidis to be the worst possible thing, top theory, non-believers. And so they dug trenches, machine gunned all the men, buried the trenches, and kidnapped the women and sold them into slavery. My, my associate producer found this young woman in a refugee camp in the part of Iraq that had not been taken over. And she explained to Rachel Morehouse, my associate producer, that she had been sold and raped and sold and raped and sold and raped over a period of a couple of weeks before the last man who bought her left the door unlocked. She slipped out and through some miracle found a sympathetic family who was willing to take her back over that line that I showed you before. She's 21 years old. So Rachel asked her to come visit with me to see if she would do an interview. So she came to the place where we set up our cameras and she's shaking. She does not want to do this. And the very first thing I said to her was, let's not do this. I can see that you're very upset. I understand why. Let's not do this. Somehow she wanted to. One of her problems was that the Yazidi community is extremely conservative and rape in that community carries tremendous stigma. It would within her own family but she still thought the world had to know. So she had conditions. She wanted to wear a scarf. She didn't want us to use her name. She wanted all the men in my team to stand behind curtains while we did the interview, and she wanted Rachel Morehouse to sit next to her and hold her hand. We did all those things. And she told me her story, which we put on 60 Minutes, a horrific, horrific story. We took her back to the refugee camp. It occurred to me while we were doing the interview, in the beginning she was very frightened, very reticent. And then as the interview went on, she seemed to develop a confidence. And it occurred to me, that when we started the interview, she was speaking for herself, and then she realized she was speaking for her people. Germany resettled thousands, tens of thousands of Yazidis into Germany. She went with them. She joined a Yazidi refugee human rights organization in Germany. She became active in human rights. The United Nations heard about her and asked her to speak at a convention in Geneva about the crimes that women in particular suffer 
in war zones, and so she does that. Five years later, five years after our interview, I am sitting in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. My phone rings, and it was at that moment that I learned that this woman, Nadia Murad, had won the Nobel Peace Prize. We had, I have a picture of Nadia here somewhere. There it is. She won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for the work that she had done exposing the crimes that women suffer in war. For a reporter, that's a pretty good day's work. To pluck this young, frightened woman out of this refugee camp, give her a voice, give her an opportunity to speak to the world and look at where she took it. Today, she's working with the human rights lawyer, Amal Clooney, and they are advocating war crimes trials in Iraq for the members of ISIS that committed these crimes. Let me just tell you one more thing before we take questions. I'm a little bit over time, which is uh, probably the greatest sin that a television reporter can commit. <laughs> when I was anchoring the CBS Evening News in the first year of the Trump administration, we were very frank about when the president was telling the truth and when he was not. And one day, I'm walking off the set after the broadcast, I look at the phone, and the president has tweeted that CBS News is the enemy of the American people. As it happened, I was having lunch with the president at the White House the next week, me and several of my colleagues, and so I sat down with the president, and I said, you know, Mr. President, this enemy of the American people rhetoric worries me a great deal. Criticize the media. There's plenty to criticize. And it's, criticizing the media has been part of politics for 220 years in my country. But enemy of the American people makes me worry that some deranged individual is going to walk into a newspaper or a radio station and shoot the receptionist because she's the enemy of the American people. The president paused, and he looked back at me, and this is a direct quote. The president said, I don't worry about that. A few months later, I got a call from the FBI. The agent was telling me that it was what they call a duty to warn call. That a man named Caesar Sayak was mailing letter bombs to people he considered to be enemies of the president, and on his computer, they had found a file on me and my home address. Fortunately, they had arrested him before he was able to mail a bomb to my family. And I had been wrong about my concerns of the hateful rhetoric. It wasn't the hateful rhetoric about the media. It was the hateful rhetoric about immigration that caused a young man in August of last year to walk into a Walmart and murder 22 people because they were Hispanic. A Walmart in El Paso, Texas. And if they were Hispanic, in the government's mind, how could they be Americans? You remember at the beginning of this evening, I was talking about there not being any democracy without journalism. This is something that Madison understood so well when he wrote the Bill of Rights and wrote the First Amendment, which is emblazoned on the wall here in the Cronkite School, as it should be. There was a worse time in journalism. You have to go back a little ways. Uh, 1798, when Congress passed and the President signed the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act, get this, made it a felony to criticize any member of Congress or the President of the United States. People went to jail for writing critical articles about the government. Madison wrote a critique of the Sedition Act in 1800, and in that critique he said this, 
Freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. Madison knew that if we could read what we wanted to read, say what we wanted to say, write what we wanted to write, then all the rights he put in the Bill of Rights would be protected. For the vast majority of Americans, freedom of the press is a right, but not for us. Not for us. For those of us in journalism, freedom of the press is risk and work and endless days of toil so that everyone can enjoy Madison's guarantee of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. executive producer of 60 Minutes that I ran long. It just isn't done. Uh, but we do have a couple of ladies with microphones. If anybody has a question about journalism, 60 Minutes, uh, politics, I will either answer your question or make up an answer that sounds plausible. Uh, thank you again for spending time here at ASU, Mr. Crowley. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. I've watched 60 Minutes my whole life. Uh, and. I was just wanting to know that journalism seems to be at a time of change, a turning point in its history so much, whether it be technology or the uh, people who may disagree with us and even hate us. Uh, what would you say is the solution to, or what change would you uh, have to made by us or by just the people in general to ensure that journalism is continued and that such great journalism, journalism such as Cronkite, Brokaw, and yourself uh, created, uh, what, what would we have to do as future journalists to ensure that continues? Well, that is the question that, that we're facing right now and that the, journal, that the journalists of the future will be facing in the years to come. You know, young people, young journalists have come to me with regard to the enemy of the American people rhetoric and all of the criticism of the media and said, what do we do? And the answer to that is, do your job. Do your job every day. Make sure that what you're writing is fair and accurate. Make sure that the work that you're doing is such that the audience can understand what you're trying to tell them. Just do your job and do it really well every day. A guy came up to me on the street the other day in Manhattan and said, oh, this must be a terrible time to be a reporter. And I said, no, it's a great time to be a reporter because really the whole country is looking at us in journalism. And it's an opportunity to show people what we do, how we do it, and what our values are. It's a great time, it's an ideal time to be a reporter in this country, in my view. One thing uh, that your question reminds me of is this, and I'm always telling young people this, and I was telling uh, uh, some students this earlier tonight. You know, there's this revolution in media, right? I now watch 60 Minutes on my iPad on Tuesday or whenever I want to see it. I read all my newspapers on my phone now. That's distribution. Revolution in distribution. There is no revolution in content. In content, the rules never change. It doesn't matter if you're working on a glass tablet or a stone tablet, the rules haven't changed in 2,000 years. Is it right? Is it fair? Is it honest? And that's what we need to keep in mind. So often, young people are being told, well, all the rules are out the window because we've created all these different ways to disseminate the news and all these different channels. No, that's distribution. The rules of content, no matter how the audience is getting your work, they deserve your best effort to make sure that it's fair and right and honest. Another question. Yes, please. Hey, um, I just, I grew up watching you on the news every single night um, as the CBS anchor, but I want to know about your war correspondent history. How do we as journalists trust what 
I mean, we can't trust what the government says. We always have to question it. We're not but, supposed to. Well, we're not That's supposed to. our job, exactly. But um, how, do, how can we, like, with no experience, just go over there, be a war correspondent, deal with what we're seeing, and then translate it back to a way that the, I guess, viewers will understand it, because it's so big, it's a whole other country, and so complicated with its own history. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, at, at no other time do the American people deserve accurate information than when we are at war. The President doesn't go to war. Pentagon doesn't go to war. It's the American people's sons and daughters who go to war. It's the treasure of the American people that is spent in our wars. And that is fine. But in return, those of us who send our children off to war or go to war ourselves deserve to have independent information from the battlefield. Uh, you, you asked about my experience. I went to Iraq 26 times, uh, and I went to Afghanistan 10 times, uh, and spent a great deal of time with amazing men and women in the Marine Corps, and the Army, and the Air Force, and Navy, just so inspirational. Uh, many of the things that I've seen in my life was saved on many occasions by those great young Americans. But you can't have a situation the way we did in the Gulf War in 1991, where reporters were largely kept off the battlefield and the Pentagon told the story it wanted to tell from a hotel several hundred miles away from the battlefield. And to the credit of the Bush administration, uh, when we decided that we needed to invade Iraq, they did embed lots of reporters with many, many units. I thought that was a great thing, but I also felt, and Bill Owens was my producer then too, that independent reporting was needed. And so when the invasion occurred, Bill and myself and our camera crew, we just crossed in with the invasion force and went where we wanted to go and did what we wanted to do with a satellite uplink so that the American people would have one more channel of independent reporting. And so that is very risky to do. We might have been killed by either side, but it's absolutely vital to the functioning of a democracy. That, that is when the American people need the best efforts of every journalist, is when this country is at war. Another question? Yes, sir. I just want to, I just want to say again, thank you so much for talking to all of us. It truly is an honor. And I don't know if you remember in high school, uh, uh, when I was in high school, my uh, school broadcast team actually went to New York, Eye Vision, and they interviewed you. Hooray! Yeah, and uh, I didn't get to go. Oh! <laughs> no, it's sad scene, but here we are. Um, I wanted to ask, if you were a, uh, a journalist in college today at the Cronkite School, what would you do now uh, to ensure that your career would have led to the same position that you're in now? Okay, I'll tell this story as quickly as I possibly can. First of all, I, I would tell you to study writing. Um, writing is what separates the pros from the amateurs. There's no such thing as good writing. There's only good rewriting. And you, you'll, be, no, you'll be amazed. You write something, you set it aside for an hour or a day or overnight, you look at it again, you see so many opportunities and so many problems, you rewrite it again. We rewrite our stories at 60 Minutes a dozen times, top to bottom, rewrites. I was rewriting a script um, earlier today upstairs. Pay attention to writing, read good writers. Um, even if you're working in visual media, writing is so important. The other thing that I would advise everyone rising up through the college now and going out into the great job world is don't take no for an answer. CBS, I was working at the ABC TV station in Dallas in the 1980s. CBS called me and said, why don't you come up? and meet Dan Rather and the president of the news division and all the vice presidents and we'll see whether you're uh, 
made for CBS News in terms of being correspondent. So I borrowed money from my fiance and bought a new briefcase. She's been my wife for 37 years now. I paid her back for the briefcase. <laughs> and I got myself a new tie and I went to New York to collect my reward. And I had all the meetings and it went incredibly well for two days and I went home and they didn't call me back. They didn't even call me to tell me no, they just didn't call. A year later, I called CBS and I said, hey, I've got new stuff, I'd like to come see you. Long story short, I went up there, had all the same meetings, two days, went really, really well, I went home, they didn't call me back. Third year. A friend of mine working at CBS calls and says they're hiring three new correspondents, now's your chance. So I called the director of recruitment and I said, hey, it's Scott Pelley again, I'd like to come see you, etc. This is a direct quote. The director of recruitment said, Scott, we know your work and there's no need for you to apply. And I said, have you filled the jobs? And he said, no, why? And I said, because I'm coming to see you. And I got on a plane on my own dime, flew up there to see him. He gave me about 10 or 15 minutes. And in the Tom Hanks Hollywood version of, the film, of this film, I get the job. Didn't happen then either. <laughs> it was another year before I got hired. So that's four years. This is my point. Don't take no for an answer. You're going to collect no's like it's your hobby. But if you have the song in your heart for journalism and other people don't hear that, that's their problem, not yours. You know what you want to do. And you keep at it. The only people who don't work in our profession are the people who quit, the people who give up. It's a very competitive thing. I don't want to BS you at all. It's very competitive. But you can do it. You can sharpen your work every day of your life, and you can do it. You just can't take no for an answer. You cannot be discouraged. Because the no's are going to come at you 30 to 1, especially when you're just starting out. But you can make it happen. One, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Hunt, and I'm a sophomore at the Cronkite School. We're really excited that you're here, and it's been great to be able to hear you speak on all these uh, very memorable events. And my question for you is, um, as you were speaking about the 9-11, reporting and you drop to your knees and you pray for all of those people how do you incorporate being a religious person as a journalist in a fair and unbiased way because i'm sure as Cronkite students we're all of different faiths and religions and you reported on a religious woman in the, um, iraq that you had interviewed how do you maintain that perspective but also include your own without being unfair advice? Well, you know, I think you deal, uh, the two things you're not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving are politics and religion, right? So I think you deal with uh, religion in a similar way that you do with politics. In, in journalism, you're agnostic. You write about all religions um, in, a, in a very fair and even way. Um, you try to expose the lies that other people tell about those religions. Uh, Islam leaps to mind in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And you don't put your thumb on the scale. You, you should be able to do a story and the person watching the story has no idea whether you're a Jew or Islamic or Yazidi or anything else. And so you have to, you have to keep your own particular uh, thoughts out of that. I didn't report that day that I was on my knees praying, right? That was just, I'm just sharing that with you because that's what was happening in my heart at that moment. But um, religion is a difficult subject to work with. And so you have to do your research, be informed, and treat it in a very even-handed way, respecting the beliefs of others, even if you don't share those beliefs. And that is also true of politics, respecting the beliefs of others, even if you don't share those beliefs. That's what we have to do. That's the tension in the work that we do as journalists, is to try to stand back, 
recognize our own biases, and we have them, and make sure they don't end up on the script. Yes, please. I'll just go for it. All right, so you've got the voice for it. Thank you. Um, early, thank you so much for being here, first of all. I wasn't expecting to sit down and have tears starting to come to my eyes for some of the stories you were telling, so thank you. But you said earlier that it's important to study writing, so I'm just curious, what are some of your favorite things that you have read recently or that have made a particular impact on you? Let, let me uh, let me approach that question in a way that might be a lot more useful. Let me give you let me let me give you a couple of things out of the toolbox. Don Hewitt created 60 Minutes in 1968. Everyone told him it was a terrible idea. In fact, he tried to create it years before, and the CBS wouldn't let it. Nobody wanted it. Don was a little bit of a genius. He was a great newsman and a great showman. Anyway, I got I had a chance to work with Don in the last few years his career at 60 Minutes. And Don would tell us two things. First, tell me a story. You'd go into Don's office and you'd say, Don, climate change, you gotta do a climate change story. And he'd go, that's an issue. Tell me a story. Best way I can describe that is through the work of Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg did not do a movie called D-Day. He did a movie called Saving Private Ryan. You learned everything there was to know about Eden in that tiny little story. He didn't do a movie called The Holocaust. He did a movie called Schindler's List. You learned everything you needed to know about The Holocaust in that tiny little story. And that's what Don meant by, that's an issue, tell me a story. The second thing Don used to tell us was, find people who can tell that story better than we can. And that is find the most captivating interviews you possibly can. Everyone has a story. In my experience, about 5% of people can tell their story. I wanted to do a piece about families who were living in their cars after they had lost their homes in the Great Recession in Florida. My producer, Nicole Young, went down to Orange County, Florida, and went to homeless shelter after homeless shelter after homeless shelter and spoke to 60 people to find the five that I would come back and interview on camera. So find people who can tell the story better than we can. The other issue in terms of writing is something I mentioned already. There is no such thing as good writing. There is only good rewriting. It depends on what your deadline is. If your deadline is tonight, you may be able to put that thing away for 20 minutes before you look at it again. But the most important gift the writer can give himself is reflection. Have an opportunity to reflect. Look back at the script. You will find opportunities. You will find problems that you never saw in the first draft. Uh, never stop rewriting until your deadline makes you stop. John McPhee, M-C-P-H-E-E. -E. It's a great author to read. John is a professor of journalism at Princeton. He's about 88 years old. He wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book. He's written 25 books, nonfiction books, but they're written in a literary style. John is one of those writers who describes something that you've seen every day of your life but you never understood it until you read it the way John described it. You say to yourself, yes, that's exactly the way that feels. John's uh, Pulitzer Prize was for a book he wrote called Animals of the Former World. Do not start there. It is a thousand pages on geology. It is wonderful, but don't start there. Start with coming into the country. It's John's reflections and his adventures in the backcountry of Alaska, uh, several years old. If you start to read that and get carried away by the story and the characters, stop. You're doing it wrong. Read it like a writer. Look at the sentence structure. Look at the way he describes common things. Go home tonight and find ten things in your home that you have never seen before. I promise there are 10,000 of them. That is how a journalist trains himself. If you don't see things that I can't see, 
if you don't hear things that I don't hear, what do I need your journalism for? Right? You have got to be, uh, human beings are awful at observing things. And so that's where you come in as a writer. You observe things. You see more in the room. You see more in that person than I do. And that makes your writing fascinating to me. One more. One more question. One more. Uh, let, let, me, let me tell you about the depth of my sacrifice standing here. Both my kids went to Clemson. Uh. <laughs> and we are 18 minutes into the national championship game. But I would rather be here with you. <laughs> Go right ahead. Well, I'm, I'm looking to do the same thing after this question, so we're in the same boat. But my question, earlier on you were talking about how poisoning information is the fastest way to destroy democracy. In your eyes, what exactly does it mean for information to be poisoned? Well, uh, for the kinds of things that we have seen uh, recently, the, the, the Russians posing as uh, American websites, uh, with, with all, just churning the political rhetoric in our country. Um, if you haven't read the Mueller report, you really should. Um, the Mueller report was kind of got obscured about whether the president had done something wrong or not. But what's really great about it is it is a microscopic examination of how the Russian military intelligence group, the GRU, invaded our election and tried to just not so much to put a thumb on the scale for one candidate or the other just to create chaos just to create that's what the russians do they, they just try to create a mess so that you can't really tell what's true and what's not in fact they, they try to create the impression that it's not even possible to know what's true and what's not so that is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. And unfortunately, this lesson has rubbed off on politicians in our country, both on the left and on the right, who have lost touch with the values of telling the truth. And so now this infects the internet. You know, it used to be that a politician, when I was coming up, there were three television networks, as God intended. <laughs> and if a politician told a lie, we would research it, because that's what journalists do, and we would go on television and say, this is a lie. Well, now there's every kind of media outlet out there, and when somebody creates a falsehood, there's no filter there to help the audience understand what's true and what's not. And so this is what I mean by poisoning the information. Um, this is not a problem in Russia. It's not a problem in China. They control the media in those countries. They don't have this problem. This is a problem that is unique to democracies that have free speech. And this is, as I say, this is exactly where journalism comes in. Journalism is the antidote to rumor and gossip. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.